Okay, we're check. Oh, we've got all the way all the way to verse eleven, brethren. Wow, we're really moving on. Let's get to verse eleven. There's twelve. Okay. Again, we won't get there going that way. All right, now look. He starts describing these men, and you can make an outline of this. What what are these men like? And remember, they're in the in the midst of the people that John, Jude is talking to. Well, he starts talking about them. They're like sunken rocks. Now, this word he used there is an interesting word, the spilas, and it's got two or three possible meanings. It can have like rock, rocks that are washed up on the seashore. Uh, they're like a reef that you're going with your boat and you hit it, or you have a clean garment and they're a dirty spot on your garment. Any one of those things. And I like to think about it saying, these men are like rocks in your rice. How do you like to be eating rice and all at once you find out that one of that parts is not rice? Huh? So you thought they were part of you and all at once you got a broken tooth. Right? All right. They are all right. They are the ones who come and share in your love feast. Now that wording there, love feast, is kind of getting old, oh, Kenneth. Brethren, I keep messing up. Remember the book of 1 Corinthians 11, where Brother Paul says, when you come together, it's for the worse, not for the better. And he says that, that they have not done what they should. And what were they doing? Someone said, oh, they're not preparing their hearts enough to take of the Lord's Supper, or maybe they got a sin in their life. Or the, he's not talking about that. They were having a meal together. And that meal is supposed to, it's called a, a love feast. It's when a slave and his master sit down at the same table. And they both know that in the eyes of God, they're no different. So when we eat the food together, I've never had anything good all week because I'm a slave. And you're a rich man and you eat good every day. But when I come to the assembly, huh, what do I find? Well, you got there first and you ate all the food. And besides that, you got drunk. And Brother Paul says, you have not respected the Lord's body. And he's not talking about the bread. And he's not talking about the wine. He's talking about the brethren. And he says, that's what you people are. You are, you are what? They share in your, they're there, supposed to be good Christians, but we know that they're immoral. We know that they're crooked. So they share the pleasure of your love feast, unrestrained by fear while caring only for themselves. He said, they're clouds without water. Now, brethren, we know about clouds without water. I mean, last year for four months in the north of the Philippines, we knew about clouds without water, but we had clouds. In Texas, we see clouds, and when you see clouds in Texas, where I live, you know what you say? There's a cloud. Now, the country where I've come up, where I was raised, if you see a bunch of clouds, someone says, what's going to happen? Said, well, it's going to rain, but not in Texas, because clouds can be clouds without water, blown about by the wind. Huh? They look like they're going to do something, but they don't do it. He says, that's what these fellows are. They... They look like they've got something to give you, but they're not. They're driven away by the winds. They're fake. They're trees that cast the fruit barren, doubly dead. Now, this is an interesting phrase. Doubly dead. If you see a tree that is barren, that means it does not have any fruit, right? It's like Sarah felt, my womb is dead. It has no fruit. That's one death. But then... He says, and not only that, but since they've given up what they believe, they're like a tree that you jerked out of the ground. So what they're doubly dead, uprooted. I have a question. What are the roots of a tree for? Sir? Okay. A tree cannot stand. I went to I went to the state of Florida after the big typhoon air, uh, hurricane Andrew went there, and I discovered something. The trees in in Florida don't have any tap root in the middle to hold it down. They just lay them over, and you don't see any big root there. But if you've got a root that goes down deep, it keeps the tree from being moved, and the roots are there to do what? To feed it, so it will have fruit. But these men, first of all, have no fruit. That means they're dead. And these men have no roots. 
Their roots are out. They've given up the roots, and they're doubly dead, he says. He's very, very poetic in what he's saying. Look, what else are they? They're like you go down the seashore. They're wild waves of speed. What's these wild waves doing? They're, see, they're not directed waves. They're wild waves, foaming out their own shame. Ah, when you see the foam there is the foam that talks about their wickedness. Like a wave that shows its wickedness or what's gone over. All right. <clears throat> and look at wandering stars. Why did Paul have so much trouble when he was going to Rome? What happened with Paul when he went to Rome? What happened to that ship he was on after they got... Yeah, but my question is, what happened to Paul on his way to Rome? They were supposed to stay under Crete, and they didn't, and they got a wind blowing, but there was clouds and storm. Why didn't they steer for land? Because in those days, you didn't know where you were unless you could see the stars. And if a star moves its position, you can't guide by the star. And I know about these things because we used to fly in the Pacific Ocean with a small airplane with two engines. Huh? Coming to the Philippines because there's a typhoon. And one time a very proud navigator on our plane discovered that our radar wasn't working. Well, and then he discovered that our radio direction finder wasn't working. So we couldn't find Manila and Guam and find out where we're here. So what did he have to do? On top of our plane, there was a plastic bubble, and he had to take a sextant up there and find the North Star, a star he knew, and shoot that star to find out where we were. No different than if we were on a sailing ship on the ocean. But if there's a star that doesn't stay where it's supposed to in the orbit it's supposed to stay in, it is worthless. If there's a Christian that doesn't maintain the faith once for all delivered to the saints, he is a wandering star out of orbit. Oh, this man's very wise. All right. Wandering star. For wisdom, for wisdom is reserved in huh? For whom? What's happened to these people? What's going to happen to these people? There is a reserve, a dense darkness of age-long duration. They're not going to escape the judgment of God. But isn't he poetic? You know what I think? I think he preaches a lot. I think him and Brother Peter both preach this a lot because there are probably a lot of places they had to say it. They didn't have a radio to get on. They didn't have a newspaper to get. They had to go talk to people. I don't know what he did. Now, all, who's this Enoch? It was about these, the Enoch who belonged to the seventh generation of Adam prophesied. So way back the seventh man who was the generation from Adam, he had something to say. What did he say? Joel, Jude says he talked about the people I'm dealing with. He talked about fake Christians. Okay. Prophesied saying, the Lord has come to attended by myriads of his people to execute judgment upon all and to convict the ungodly of all the ungodly deeds which in their ungodliness they have committed. And of all the hard words which they, they ungodly sinners as they are, have spoken against him. Wow. One big word stands out there, and that's that word, ungodly. Okay? Now, I've got to think about some of this. Uh, we're in verse 14. In 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, Jesus is talking to the Thessalonians who are being persecuted by people. The, by the Jews, probably at that time. And what does he say? You who are persecuted, rest with us. Because at the revelation of Jesus Christ, with his flaming, with his angels in flaming fire, he will take vengeance upon those who know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Right? Think again another thing. Think back when the high priest is trying to condemn Jesus in Matthew 26. He can't find any witness that can prove Jesus is wrong. And finally he says, I adjure you by God. If you respect God, answer this question. Are you the Son of God? Are you the Christ, the Son of God? And Jesus refused to answer. No. The judge is forcing him to testify. Right? He can't resign. So he said, you've said it. But I tell you, you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of God and coming with the myriad. Though he not only answered, but he warned. The high priest thought he was going to win. No, 
I am the Son of God. I am the Christ. I am the Son of God, he said. And you will see me seated at the right hand of God, and you will see me coming with the angels. What's, what's, what is what is what Enoch said that was going to happen? Exactly that. So long ago. So, we, if we give up where we stand, if we give up the truth that we know, what will be our fate? Cannot be. Brother Peter is going to shout at you all the way through his book, I want you to remember, I want you to remember, I want you to remember. Now, I can't go and tell you my grandfather said something and tell you take what my grandfather said to the courthouse. Because the judges said, I don't care what your grandfather said unless he's here saying it. It's not testimony, right? But I heard it. I know that's why it's hearsay evidence. <clears throat> but these men didn't have hearsay evidence. They had personal knowledge. Okay. Now, who are these men? Look at their character. These men are murmurers. Ever bemoaning their lot. They're always complaining. Their lives are guided by their evil passions. And their mouths are full of big, boastful words. While they treat individual men with admiring reverence. Why? For the sake of the advantage they can gain. What's this word pandering? Anybody know what the word pandering is? Thinking. What? Thinking deeply. Thinking deeply, yeah. But you know what? Have you ever heard somebody introduce... And when they introduce him, because, hey, he might give us some money. He might give us some money. And he becomes a very, very big man. And we hear people keeping up wonderful words to make him feel so good. Every time you go to a college campus, when we have a graduation, we have a very wonderful man speaking. Especially if he's already endowed the college. Now, I'm not saying that's bad to appreciate but see, they appreciate people, and they call you na-na, ta-ta, and apo, so that you might give me something huh? uh, for advantage. They're crooked. They're very ugly. Now, what about us? But as you, my dearly beloved friends, remember the words that before now were spoken by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How they declare to you, in the last times there shall be scoffers obeying only their own ungodly passions. The last days these things will come. And I remember the Hebrew letters start saying something like that. In times before God spoke unto the prophets, the fathers by the prophets, but he has in these last days spoken unto us by a son through whom he created the world. And he's to be the heir of all things. Okay. So, he said, you remember, they said in the last time, there will be scoffers obeying only their own ungodly passions. Now, you can find a lot of that in Brother Paul's writing. Um, and it's not on your paper there. But 1 Timothy 1.10, 2 Timothy 4.3, Titus 1.9, he talks about this, that there's going to be these times. Okay, and we're going to hit it again in 1 Peter, I mean, 1 Peter 2.2, 2, Brother Bob will talk about it. All right. These are those who cause divisions. They are men of the world, wholly unspiritual. But you, dearly beloved, I'll get them back with you. No. Build yourself up on the basis of your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. So what do you want us to do? I want you to build yourself up on the basis of your most holy faith. When Brother Paul started congregations as he did in the Galatian region, you read in Acts chapter 14, that he come back and he strengthened the souls of the saints. The only way you can strengthen someone's soul is not by thinking you have a miraculous power to do it, but by teaching them what God has said. They shall all be taught of God. That's how it's going to happen. Am I right? I think so. And praying in the Holy Spirit, in, in the guidance of God, Praying for what God wants, not what you want. In other words, not praying in the carnal nature that we have. All right, what else? You must, all right, and you must keep yourself safe in the love of God. You can trust God. Is heaven closer to Singapore than it is Manila? Well, you all laugh at me. Is, is, is heaven closer to Seoul than it is Manila? Is heaven closer to Los Angeles than it is to Manila? It depends on if you're migrating. <laughs> what am I trying to say? 
any place that you're a Christian, God is as close to you as he is to anybody else. And you can keep yourself in the love of God no matter where you are. All right. Safe in the love of God. What are you waiting for? Waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ which result in the life of the ages. We need this mercy because even though we're striving to be very unlike those people, there may be some things wrong in our lives. But when we face Jesus, we do not have anything to worry about, right? He that hath the Son hath the life. We do not come under condemnation. We do not come under judgment because the Son has already saved us. So, when they argue with you, you must endeavor to convince. So, when they argue with you, you try to convince them. You seek, he says, have mercy upon some. That's how the other translation says, you have mercy on them. But what if you don't like them? What if they're so bad you just really do the hope they go to, you know? No, mercy means, mercy means giving people what? Not what they deserve. Give them what they don't give them what they deserve. Grace means giving them what they don't deserve. Get, did I make you up? Mercy means what? I stand before the judge and say, Your Honor, I'm guilty. But would you please give me mercy? All right. So what do you do to these people? When you find them getting all mixed up, turning away, and doing all these things, you have mercy for them. When you discuss with them, you must endeavor to convince them. Others, you must try to save. Those are not even. You must try to save them, like you're picking them up out of the flames, because he just said they were going to be condemned, and you're going to keep them from burning forever. And then, and on others, look with pity, mingle with fear. Why? Because in Galatians 1, verse 6, Brother Paul says, If one of our brothers is overtaken in a trespass, you who are close to God, you who are spiritual, do what? You save that one, but be careful, lest the thing that caught him will catch you. In America, and I think in the Philippines too, we have Alcoholics Anonymous. Where a former alcoholics get up and say, I'm an alcoholic because I drink, I'm dead. And they have to be very careful when they go to help somebody else that they don't join together in the sin. Oh, people like to pick on you Christians and say, would you preach in a tavern? Would you preach in a brothel? Would you preach in a bad place? And I always answer, the first time they invite me, I will go. But until they invite me, I will not go. That's not what they're there for, right? But the influence must flow from us to others, not others to us. Good influence, yes. Bad influence, no. So we have to be strong enough to be the ones who save them, being afraid that we ourselves might be, saved, be lost. Because let's face it, many of the temptations that people fall to, we also are tempted by. Right. While you look, how do you, you hate even the traces of their sin. It's like you pull them out of the place and their clothes are so filthy, you don't want to touch the filth they've been involved in. Huh? That's what he's saying. So, What's our due? He's told us what these people are like. He's told us why they're that way. And now he's telling us this is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to do our best to save them. So he's not arguing, telling us to become great debaters, great arguers. No. We are defenders of the faith of Jesus Christ. And it's not going to change. Once for all. Okay. <clears throat> now, time to thank God. See, he's going to finish his letter. Time to thank God. But to him who is able to keep you safe from stumbling. Ah, Joe, Joe, Jude knows that the Christians he's writing to can make it and cause you to stand in the presence of his glory, free from blemish and full of exultant joy. Job said, all right, I know you can make it, and you're going to be in the presence of God, and you're going to be very, very happy. How happy are you going to be? What are you going to be like? John was a very close friend of Jesus, right? John was the last of the apostles. But when he writes 1 John chapter 3, he said, Now we are the children of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know this. When he appears, 
we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So I don't even know what that joy is going to be like. But it's going to be great, correct? If I've loved you here, I'll still love you there. And you'll love me, and we'll be together. To the only God, all right, to the only God, our Savior. How? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. How do I dare come to you, Father, because of the Son? I thought, this is not a magic formula we put on our prayers in the name of Jesus. I'm not a stranger walking to God. You look at that beautiful picture of the, 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 the scene of the throne of God in the book of Revelation and imagine your little voice being heard there. But you don't have to worry because why? We, I like something about what we do here in the Philippines. When we go someplace, we're going to have to go to a big man's important office. Huh? We're very happy if one of our friends happens to be the secretary. Huh? Do you know anybody at customs? Do you know anybody at immigration? Uh, right? And we got a good habit there because I'm not afraid if I walk in it. And here I'm a nobody, a little man. My shoes are not even matching my pants. And I'm walking in and here this man is walking in. He's a big man there. Why? Oh, hi, how are you? Fine, sir. I want you to meet my friend. Huh? Wow, no problem, huh? Okay, we do because it's through Jesus Christ our Lord. And to our God be ascribed glory, majesty, might, and authority. Now look, he says always in the past and the now and in the ages to come. When God says, I am, and they say, what were you like? What do you mean, what was I like? I am. Well, I was, I, was, I was then. Well, what about now? I am now. What about the future? I am. You're the one that has problem with time. God doesn't. He's not sitting in time. Oh, I, why? How can this happen? How could God let it happen? He didn't know it was going to He can read the front of the book. He can read the middle of the book. He can read the end of the book. Because he's not tied to the book. Correct? Your life, he can see the end of it before the beginning of it if he wants to because he knows all things. And he stands outside of time. And you cannot fathom that because you must always think yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Correct? Yes. But he's when alive, we'll go, he's alive forever. He's alive forever. Yeah. And every, he listen, is. if someone approaches you with a faith, wherein there is not a God who is the foundation of that faith, I can tell you now, it's got to be a false faith. <clears throat> Don't tell me that I'm going to be reincarnated because somebody has to say why I'm reincarnated. Don't tell me this, don't tell me that. Is that right? Upon this foundation stands the grandeur of our faith. And who is God and what's he like? No man has seen God at any time. But the only begotten Son, who when Brother Paul John writes his letter, says, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. What's our God like? What do you want to find out? You better study about Jesus. All right? Now, how much time we got left? Wow, it's 740. We got 20 minutes left. <laughs> we got 20 minutes left. Now, let me do this. <clears throat> let me start. Second Peter. If you want an exciting book, Second Peter is an exciting book. Now, we've already discovered that he's a man to love. Now, let me ask you something. Just for your fun. You know, we admire Paul. We admire Peter, all right? But suppose you were going to take a walk with one of these two men. Who would you rather walk with? That's just a personal question. There's no right or wrong. You know who I'll choose? We have to them. We have to well, I, I don't think they're I don't want to, I don't want to walk both at the same time. Because uh, they're just uh, ministers of Christ. Yes. I also prefer Jesus Christ. Oh, wait, wait. But, but I'm not giving you that choice. <laughs> because I want to emphasize something about the character of these two men, okay? Because Brother Pablo, I always see him as right. <laughs> Brother Paul, I don't, I don't catch Brother Pablo making any mistakes. Do you? <laughs> Have you? Can you look at all his letters or all the story of Brother Pablo? He didn't. The only he was always correct, except when he killed the Christians, of course. But my point is, I'd like to walk with Peter because I kind of feel he, I feel he's kind of warm, you know. And if I fall down, <clears throat> he'll get me up and dust me off, and, and I say, I'm so sorry. Ah, uh, that's all right. I did it too. You know, just remember, just remember, don't do it again. I can tell you, that's my imagination. Play. Okay. So we got this outline. Okay. We got the outlines there. <clears throat> we'll give them to you. Uh, 
When did Peter write this, you think? Well, about the same time you wrote his, correct? You boys are very strong and intelligent, aren't you? <laughs> Why don't you pass these out for me to everybody? Okay? Make sure everybody gets one. Can you do that? You can all three do it or one of you do it? Thank you. Okay. Let me turn this off and we'll talk about this. <laughs> In this letter, you have some of the most wonderful things said to us. Again, Simon Peter talks about who he is. He's a bondservant, a slave of Jesus Christ. And he's writing to those who have the same precious faith as that which are, is ours through the righteousness of our God and our Savior Jesus Christ. And he said, may more and more grace and peace be granted you in the full knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now, <clears throat> Here's what I like about this first verse for myself. Those who have what? The same precious faith. So I always look at these men as heroes for me. But look, he says we believe the same way. Correct? We believe the same way. Has everybody got one? Was there enough or do we have to make some more? You didn't get one? But I thought I want one. Well, let me see if John can make some more. Excuse me a second. How many of you need? How many didn't get one? Just a jump in the front? Go on. John, we need some more copy, please. Okay. So it's the same precious faith that's very good. And I like this also because I think about. Uh, is there two ways to follow Jesus? Is there two ways to become Christians? Two ways. No, I think it's only one. Suppose I become a Christian the same way Paul did. Am I okay? Am I all right? Yeah. Would I be all right? So I noticed something. When Brother Paul writes Romans chapter 6, he begins to say what? That we've all become Christians the same way. Ah, so then I'm okay. What about the belief? I have the same faith that Peter did. And I see now that Brother Peter is going to make the same argument to the people of his day. You cannot change the faith that we believe. Now, by the second century, they were, brethren. By the third century, they were. They were changing what they taught about Jesus. They were changing church government. We're not condemning them. That's up to God. But we don't have to follow that. Who are we anyway? Huh? We're people trying to... What have we seen here? We saw some very ugly pictures tonight about people who were not right, correct? So I could take every one of those bad qualities and find a good quality opposite it and could be a pretty good person, right? But better than that, what Brother said a while ago, suppose I look at Jesus. Because I know in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, it says that we're supposed to grow into the fullness of the likeness of Christ. I find in, in uh, 2 Corinthians, uh, Brother Paul says, when we look in a mirror... We're not like Peter who covers his face to hide the fading glory of God. But it's like you look in a mirror and you see a face there. Whose face is it? You're supposed to be raised up into the fullness of the likeness of Christ. And when you look in the mirror, you're supposed to see who? Well, me. No, not me. Him. Isn't that amazing? We're supposed to be so like Jesus that when you look in a mirror... The reflection is a reflection of Jesus. But why wouldn't it be? Because Paul said, well, God said that light shine out of darkness. Who are you? I'm darkness. But with God puts a light in me, light shines out of darkness. We're earthen vessels. What does that mean? It means you can suffer. It means you can die. Huh? You're earthen vessels, but God has put the gospel in dying men. In unenlightened men, but he's gave the light. Uh, and people who they're supposed to reflect the glory of Christ. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, anybody? Okay. Now, he, I got this. All oh, this is this man's outline. Next point. His divine power enables believers. Seeing that his divine power has given us all things that are needful for life and godliness, through our knowledge of him who has appealed to us by his own glorious perfections. Now, how many things did the first century Christians have that they needed 
to live a life of godliness. How many things do they? How many more things do they need? If he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now I kind of understand that. Say, how to live my life and how to worship my God. Did the first thirty years? The first 60 years, did those people learn all they needed to know to live a life that pleased God and how to worship God, work for God? Did they or not? Yeah. Now, if we take that position, then I'm going to be a very careful student of this book because herein is written, and this man Peter is going to pound that home to us in his letter here, I want you to remember because he has first person testimony, and it cannot be replaced. Okay? And that, but brethren, we are a people trying to become like this picture, aren't we? I was like, what are you doing, brother? Are you trying to get me to leave, your, leave my cult and go to your cult? No, I don't care where you go. I just want you to become like the picture. If you'll become like the picture, and I'll become like the picture, we'll look like twins. We'll be Christians, right? What God wants is it all to fit the picture. And it's a very difficult picture because it's like a big jigsaw puzzle. The picture is there, but you've got to have every piece in the puzzle fitting together so that the people of God, the church of God, looks like what God wants the church to look like. That makes sense to you all? This is the appeal we come. People always ask me on the bus, oh, because don't show your Bible to people when you're traveling. They want to talk about religion in the Philippines. And it, uh, what's your church? <laughs> and I say, if I answer your question, i got to answer six more questions. Because if I say, well, you know, we registered with the Philippine government as the Church of Christ. Ah, oh, Mormon? No, I'm not a Mormon. Ah, oh, UCCP? No, I'm not UCCP. Ah, oh, Fourth Ward? Sa'an. <laughs> six times I have to say no. So I say, no, no, no. I am a person belonging to a movement. Now, if you're part of a movement, you're not there yet. You're going someplace, but you're not there yet. But you're going far enough that you can recognize us, huh? And we're a part of a movement. And we're urging people to become the people of the picture in the Bible. Now, you can't find that in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th century. You've got to find it in the 1st century. Because that's where the picture is drawn. So we look at Jesus and try to become like that. And we're urging people to become that. Therefore, I'm not judging you. Stay where you are. Do what God wants you to. Now, if they won't let you do what God wants you to, what do you have to do? You must obey God rather than men. Let's face it. That's who we are. We have a like precious faith with that of Brother Peter. Okay. Does this make sense to you all? I don't let you. I get excited about this idea because I can talk to anybody. Well, um, I don't care what you tell me about your cult or sect or anything. I don't care. I just want to know this. When you, I look at a picture that Jesus drew of us in the Bible, do I see you? And do you see me? Isn't that what it's supposed to be? We're supposed to be like this picture. Well, it's not that easy. I know it's not that easy. These fellows are writing something that's not easy because they're battling to try to get us to be that picture. To go back to what God wanted us to be. This is the appeal. What other appeal do you want to use? My church is better than your church. Did I tell you that story? The preacher preaching, you know, you ought to come over and be a part of our church. Why? Because you don't have to tithe. Oh, very nice. You ought, <laughs> you ought to become a part of our church because such, 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 such. No, that's not right. You're talking about your church. Oh, yes. I'm talking about the body. How's your body? Oh, our body has the most wonderful hands. Really? Our body has the most wonderful feet. Oh, nice. Not to be indelicate, but our body has the nice legs. Really? Wow. And you keep preaching to me about your body, your body, your body. You're like a boy that goes to his tata, his daddy, and says, Father, I found the girl I want to marry. Really? Yes. What's she like? Oh, Papa. Magandang tirama. Her hands are so beautiful. Really? Well, that's nice, son. Is she a good worker? Nice hands, Papa. What about her arms? Nice arms, Papa. Now I got get chicken and stuff. Ah, what about her feet? Good feet, Papa. And Papa, I don't want to be indelicate, but you know, very pretty. Really. Son, what does she look like? No, I've been telling you, Daddy. Nice hands, nice feet, nice legs, nice body. No, son. 
What does her face look like? What does her head look like? Oh, Tatang, I've never looked at her head. <laughs> you see, when you preach to me about you and what you do, and I preach to you about me and what I do, and you tell me about your church does this and your church does that, what are you telling me? I'd like to see the head before I marry into the body. Huh? Right? Am I crazy? Am I crazy? So that's what I people say. What's your cult? I don't have a cult. What's your sect? I don't have a sect. Would you belong to something? Yes, I'm trying very hard to belong to Jesus. And we're trying, all of us, to urge one another, let's go back and be the picture. Now, there's not any religion that claims they build themselves upon the Bible, this like precious face, that has a right to object to that. Huh? If we're all walking around with a meter stick, then we're all measuring things the same way. Correct? And we're not doing that. You know, we're, we're getting things later. So uh -huh. I'm saying, hey, it's a like precious faith. It's the faith like theirs. And I want to be that. We're trying to become the picture in the Bible. Is it easy? No, they got better There's luck. There's one man on there they call the face man. In the A-team? Yeah, yeah. face man. That's me, the face man. <laughs> well, just make sure that that... <laughs> well, depends on what we look like when we look in the mirror. Right? Okay. I hope I'm not just shouting at you. How much time we got, brother? Is it not eight yet? Not that... Five minutes yet. We can get all the way through chapter one. All right. But the knowledge comes to him who appealed us for his own glory. Now... It is that, verse 4, it is by means of these that are his glorious perfection. But actually, the other translation says great promises. Ah, God has given us great promises. Okay. It is by these that he has granted to us his precious and wonderful promises. My knowledge of the one who God sent uh, was wrong. He granted us his precious and wondrous promises. Why? In order that through them you may, one and all, become shares in the very nature of God, having completely escaped the corruption which exists in the world through earthly craving. Through the promise, the precious and great promises of God, we're going to escape the corruption that's in the world. And we're going to share the divine nature. It is not talking about you becoming a God. God says, I am holy. And you are to be holy. The book of Second Peter and the book of First Peter, Brother Buchanan will hammer next week, is about holiness, separateness, separation from sin. So we'll share the divine nature in that we are separated from sin. Make sense? I believe that's right. I believe that's right. Okay. Now, verse 5 through 7. Now, this one is what we... You've got to stay more than five minutes for this. this. Here's what it says. Now, we have these great and precious promises, okay? And we're going to escape from the things of the earth. Now, he says, for this very reason, because you have these great and precious promises, what are you going to have? He said, for this very reason, I want you to add in all earnestness along with your faith. So here, he said, here's what you got. Here is your faith. Now, the word he uses there, the word he uses there is the word for spude, the great effort. If I say make every effort, you can't go at it part time. It's full time. Make every effort to add to your faith. So the foundation of what's going to happen to us is word. That's the same thing that Brother Jude was urging us to keep on it. Now, what comes out of our faith? Goodness. Goodness. Earnestness. Ah, the old word was virtue. Now, how many of you, oh, are we all, except me, Cebuanos here tonight? What do Cebuanos like to eat more than other Filipinos like to eat? Mice. We're the people of corn. Am I wrong? Do I know my Philippines? Right? We like, we know about corn, so I plant my, I'm going to plant our, here's our talon. And we plant our mice. And the first leaf that comes up is called virtue in some, excellence, moral excellence. Moral excellence. What do I should, I'm going to put the word virtue, but remember, we're talking about moral excellence. So add to your faith 
virtue. Mm. Now, what's virtue? What's moral excellence? You said you believe something. Now, you must have the courage to do what you say you believe. See, now our plant's going to grow. Our plant started to grow, so we got virtue now. Ah, what's the next lease? The next lease. You add to your virtue or to your moral excellence what? Knowledge. I thought you knew already. I thought faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. New kind of knowing. Because if I believe something and I do what I believe, I discover something. My faith works. My faith works. So I've had now I got a new kind of knowledge. Have we got any dalaga here? Dalaga? We got any uh, what's the word word for unmarried boys? Of course we have. Do they know that marriage is good? Do you unmarried people know that marriage is good? No, you believe marriage is good. You don't know marriage is good. The only way you'll know marriage is good is how? By getting married to the right person who's a Christian. All right. <laughs> you all here, listen to me? That's her? Amen. That's the dust. Okay. So now we know in a new way. Because I've had the courage to live my faith. My faith is shown it's true by the knowledge. So my plant's growing, but there's no fruit yet. Got to go a little further. And I got to get another. What's this thought going to be over here? The next one. What kind of control? No, I want you to take care of me. I don't want to have to be good. So if I cut time. I, but see, you can never be what God wants unless you have self-control. It's the only control that's any good. But until you have a faith that has the courage to do what it believes and sees it at work, you will never control yourself. So now we have self, self control. And don't argue that God's got to help you. Of course he's going to help you. He's in you to will and to work his good pleasure, but that's not the point. We must have self-control. Now, after I got self-control, what's the next thing that's going to come on my top, my, my stalk here? Huh? Endurance. Endurance? Paciencia? But you're very hard to get along with. People are hard to get along with. You've got to have patience. No fruit without time to grow. Patience. Patience. After I got self-control, I got patience. Sorry, Clint, we can't get done in time. Now I've got patience. That's part of the fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> the hard one, number four. Okay? Have self. All right. What's it? Now what I have to have after that? What's the next one? Huh? I got endurance. Power of endurance. What's next? Very hard word. Godliness does not mean godlikeness. Did you know that? No, it's sabia. It's 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 respect for God. <clears throat> the best illustration I know is what old Eli told Samuel when Samuel was in the temple in the tent of meetings. God was calling him, and he didn't know. He thought Eli was calling him, and when he come to Eli the next time, Eli said, "Oh, it's God calling." The next time God calls you, you say, speak, Lord, thy servant hears. If we have this virtue, godliness, it means we're ready to listen to God and do what God wants. Because I've already conquered myself and I have patience to go on with others. Now I have godliness. This is reverence towards God. I respect him. Everybody we're talking about who were the enemies in the last book had no godliness because he said they had ungodly done, ungodly done, ungodly done. Now, what's the next one? What kind? I don't like that one. Because, see, I want a religion where I can go off and be by myself. I like to walk in the woods. I want a religion. I don't want you people in my life. Christianity is not hard if I don't have to have you in my life. You're right, but it's not that difficult. <laughs> but isn't that all? Isn't this a hard part about Christianity? I mean, it's easy to love the people out there. But I have to deal with you. 
And after I know you a little while, you know, if we're living together, you, you know, look what you do with the toothpaste. <laughs> you never close it. You don't pick up your towel. Ta -ta 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 -ta. Hard at brotherly kindness. Philadelphia is the word. Love of your brother. Because brothers can fight. Brothers like to fight. Look at my two grandchildren. They're just cousins, and they like to do things that they have to be told not to. Well, brotherly kindness is a hard one, isn't it? But you have to be, listen, what, what is Jesus saying to us through this man? Until you can do this thing, you can never be my people. Most of the trouble in religion does not come from the outsider. It comes from us with our relationship with one another within the church. So brotherly kindness, being kind to your brother. Brotherly. I did, too, practice writing when I was in junior high. Okay. Then, the la what's the next one? Love, 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 love. You always talk about love. What are you talking about, love? Is that a movie thing? No, love. Agape. Now, <clears throat> farmers, like the brothers of Jesus, farmers, tell me something. At the top of my corn stalk, I have something. Suppose I cut that off and throw it away. What will happen? It's just a little thing. What will happen? What's it for? Will not bear fruit. Why? Why? Now wait, I'm talking to Sebuanos. They know about carn. Why won't it? I don't want love. I just want all these other things. Huh? Because this tassel, this tassel on our corn must fertilize. That stuff, to go, that fertilizes the little blooms down below so that we can have fruit. And without this, we can't have fruit. Right? Am I right or wrong? That's right. That's what it's for. See how it, look how it grows. See how it grows? Now, now then, I want to ask you. Okay. Okay, now. Now, verse 8. If these things exist in you, and continually increase. So because if these don't grow, your plant's not going to get any bigger. And if you get something on there, your 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 corn's going to be about like that, right? Not going to be big like that, right? Okay. If these things be in you and continue to increase, they prevent you from being either idle or unfruitful in advancing towards the foreknowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is wonderful. If these things be in you and abound, suddenly we have here very nice fruit. Wow, we are so lucky. No, we're not lucky. We're blessed. Look what happened. Why did you have all that fruit? Because my faith had the courage to do what it believed. I knew it was true. Then I controlled myself, and I had the patience to go on and did not quit. I respected what God wanted. I was kind to those that it's hard to be kind to, and I can love like God wants me to, and we will bear fruit. We will not be idle or unfruitful in our knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I believe that's the way this is, don't you? Isn't that pretty? Isn't that pretty? All right. <clears throat> now, if you like these things, he says in verse 9, you're blind. You can't see distant objects. And that you, this man, has forgotten that he was cleansed from his past sins. We all, time to time, rejoice in one thing. What is it? Once I was lost, but now I'm saved. Once I was afraid, and now I'm not afraid. Once I was ashamed, and now I'm not ashamed, because I have been saved by Jesus Christ. And if I forget that, I am blind and can't see afar off. Thank you all very much. Now, I'll put the rest of this, try to put the rest of this on a projection for tomorrow night, okay? Thank you very much.